Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to see so many people early in the morning here at ITB, the third day already. But I think today is a very special day, at least for me, because I'm the commissioner for CSR here at Mesa Berlin at ITB. And it's to my heart that we really try to get responsible thinking and sustainable thinking into mainstream tourism. We've been fighting for that since many years now, and the CSR Day is one part of our, of our fight for more sustainability in the tourism world. Um, it's a wonderful thing to have a day dedicated to corporate social responsibility, but I have to say that I'm also very proud that it's not only the CSR Day, but there are so many panels dealing with sustainability um, here at the convention and all over the fairground. You know, we have the discussions about over-tourism, like eight discussions just dealing with over-tourism because this is one of the big issues right now. We also have, on the other hand, discussions in Hall 4.1. There are two stages and they are bustling every day with people who want to hear more about um, sustainability. We talk about the pollution of the oceans. We talk about um, other issues which are also very important, like social issues. And yesterday, as you all know, was International Women's Day, and we had a very interesting discussion on gender equality in tourism. And I see so many women here in the audience, and um, yeah, I must say, the CSR Day, we only have one woman on the panel. I have to say that, but that is why we did the Gender Equality Day yesterday, also as part of the ITB convention in the Palais. And I think it's also important to get women on these panels. So you are young, you can help to realize that. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for standing in for sustainability. We have a couple of wonderful speakers who will help you to understand what we are really up to do and why it is important to get engaged. Um, I won't tell you who it will be because you know it already. And I just wanted to welcome you and thank you for being here and thank you for being interested. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending today's CSR Day. Um, I'm here to ask provocative questions. Um, the intention is not to pretend that everything is good. The intention is to question what is good and how we can do better, and also to identify those areas where we have issues in regard to sustainability. Um, I might be switching to the other microphone, if that's okay. To start with, um, I thought I should present you with a number of slides or a you know, quick review of what I believe are the main sustainability challenges that we are facing at the moment. And uh, you all have observed that the world has changed. One year ago, I talked about the new US president. Uh, I will today move on to other issues that have emerged, um, issues that we don't talk about much, yet they uh, seem to be really important. One thing is the growing world population. We talked a lot about it in the 1990s, but there's not much deba debate about this at the moment. However, we are soon hitting 8 billion people on this planet. We will be at least 11 billion by 2100, according to, to scenarios. And uh, that means that there's a growing number of people who need to share resources. Um, you will have noticed that we have new patterns of xenophobia emerging and national isolation. Uh, we have trade wars. Just this morning, uh, we could read in the newspapers about Trump's decision to um, impose uh, the first uh, trade tariffs on, on steel imports. We have a new wave of militarization that is threatening the long progress towards peace that we've seen in the past. Then socially, we are changing very quickly. Um, the iPhone, or rather the smartphone, has been with us for 10 years now, and it has very fundamentally changed our lives, along with social media. We are all on, the, on a constant quest for social capital in social media, and um, there's a tendency for anxieties to emerge 
along with these developments. Um, you will know that global corporations have grown in number and in power in terms of uh, how much influence they have. Uh, Amazon's founder uh, has just been called the new richest person in the world. So there is um, a lot of power that global corporations have these days for the good or the worse. We have green discourses on dematerialization. Um, we are constantly confronted in the media with a progress on um, decarbonization and dematerialization. However, I think there's often very little evidence for real progress. Resource use on a global level is increasing. And then finally, there's a new class of the super rich that I find quite interesting. The Forbes list now includes 2,043 billionaires. And obviously, there's a question uh, what that means for the global distribution of um, money, but also in terms of power. In tourism, we have different challenges. Um, tourism is supposed to support the sustainable development goals. I think uh, we could question whether tourism always does support the global de sustainable development goals. Um, we know that there is a growing global environmental footprint associated with tourism. Tourism is using more energy, more resources, more water than ever before. And there's very lim limited evidence that this trend is changing. Um, we have also, because of the rise of global digital platforms, a concentration of flows of revenues and profits, uh, largely concentrated in the United States, driven very often by venture capitalists. And that means that a lot of money is flowing into different directions out of national and local economies. We have supranational organizations. Um, I, I deleted the name here, but um, UNWTO was part of this slide. Uh, UNWTO does advocate for strong growth, even in places where we already have massive growth, such as Iceland, for instance. Iceland had seen a, an increase in international visitor arrivals by 40% over just one year. Yet UNWTO urges Iceland to continue on that path. And uh, finally, we have something that I call the agnogenesis of solutions. We talk a lot about solutions. The only thing I don't see are solutions on a global scale that would actually apply to most corporations, to most companies. We see a lot of baby steps in terms of progress towards a more sustainable tourism system by very small actors most of the time, but I don't see that the global system itself is changing. For all of these reasons, we have to discuss tourism's development critically, which is what CSR Day is for. We have four very exciting um, events today. Uh, we will start, start right up with the hot seat, sustainability and tourism. This is a conflicted relationship. We will have the OECD presenting a report on investment financing for sustainable tourism. We will have a divestment event on money rules the world, impact investing, divestment and sustainability. And finally, we will present some specific solutions from Germany for marketing sustainability in tourism and travel. Thank you for being here. We start right away with our first event for today. It's the hot seat on sustainability and tourism. And uh, I would like to um, uh, invite uh, both discussants to the scene, as well as my co-moderator, um, Eike Otto. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Ich gehe mal ganz rechts. Nico Pech, we need you. An diesem Punkt werde ich dann auch dein, dein wechseln uh, ins Deutsch. I'm going to switch to German now. We need a, um, a microphone for Nico. Thank you very much indeed. Before we're going to talk about sustainability and tourism, I would like to ask you for your opinion. Maybe we can vote. I'd like to see the question on the slide. Please do not answer immediately. First of all, I'm going to read the three options. And if I... Uh, tell you go, you can use the little device that you find next to your chair and you can choose an answer. So what is your take on 
tourism and sustainability. It's a contradiction in terms. Or number two, tourism needs to be managed efficiently in order to be sustainable. Or number three, tourism has a great general potential so as to be sustainable. Go, please vote now, either one, two or three. Here we can see a large majority with number two. Everything boils down to management. I hope that the CEOs of the world will um, see this because I'm not sure whether um, sustainability issues are discussed on an everyday basis. Apart from that, some in the audience think that this is a contradiction in terms, and some more believe that there is a potential to be tapped into. Today, we've got a very interesting panel for you. It's uh, two uh, adversaries, I would like to call them like that, for this event. This is Ike Octo, who's go the co-facilitator, the co-host of the um, panel. He is a consultant for tourism and he's very familiar with regional development as well. And uh, we've got Max Lu. The first guest is Mr. Michael Lutzaya. He comes from South Africa. But as I've heard, uh, he also has um, some roots in Germany. He started working in the field of tourism. But first of all, he started working in retail in South Africa. Then he opened up a cafe. We don't know why, but then he made his career and became the representative for Europe of uh, Weller, the well-known international company. And then he uh, went to South Africa, where he uh, worked in the field of packaging machines and import. Then rather quickly, he, fall in, he fell in love with a farmhouse, a dilapidated house at the Cape, where the African continent ends, and then he set himself the target to protect the area thanks to tourism. I hope I haven't forgotten anything. If this is the case, you can add on to that later on during the discussion because I suppose that you can tell uh, many more things. Sitting to my right, I'm very proud to introduce Nico Pich, um, a household name in Germany. He has studied economics. He's professor at the University of Siegen and he works in the field of pluralism in economics. Now. I would like to say that Mr. Pech is one of the pioneers in terms of systemics. He also um, wrote a book, Befreiung von Überfluss, on post-economy. And this has had a very important impact on debates of growth in Germany. And we still have this debate at a social and political level in Germany. There's the Gottlieb uh, Duttweiler Institute in Switzerland. He's uh, still a member on the list of this uh, institution. For the leaders of the world, uh, he's a part of the German ranking. This uh, dates back to 2015. This is ahead of Richard Dawkins and Alice Schwarzer and Stephen Hawking. So this is quite an uh, impressive achievement. So I'd like to briefly quote the Zeit Weekly published last year, Germany's most popular and radical critic of growth, unquote. It's nice to have the two of you here. Thank you very much. Today we're going to hold a critical debate. We will get down to brass tacks immediately. We raise questions you usually do not ask. And we thought, well, this would be a very good starting point. That is to, first of all, give the possibility to the two speakers to take a stance. Ike, where should we start exactly? Maybe you would like to give us your take on sustainability and tourism, and then afterwards we're going to ask Mr. Pish. I've got some pictures. I hope that I managed to click the right button there. 
Maybe you can ask the technicians to help me to get the slides here on the screen. Okay. How can we click on like this? Okay. So first of all, very warm welcome. I have to say I'm very nervous. I used to work at Vela, and they had this slogan, because beautiful hair is no coincidence. This is not my case, I'm afraid. And I thought I'll simply show you where we are located in South Africa. Some years ago, we also got connected to the long run. And this is our DNA today. This is conservation, community work. The culture of the people needs to be sustained, and this is all linked to commerce as well. It was in 1991 that we bought a small farmhouse. I did this together with my wife, the children, and my parents. And this was completely ramshackle and dilapidated. This was at the Cape of Good Hope. And we are in a, an area, more than 10,000 plants, a rich diversity, and uh, many of them are uh, endemic. This farm uh, also included alien plants, as we call them. There were many of those. And I've got some photographs for you. We we uh, quickly realized that we had to do something. We thought we had to help. And we thought, well, tourism actually is a great oppor opportunity for us. We could also work together with the local population so as to generate income. I don't have to tell you that uh, the South African state has hardly any funds for environmental protection. We've got other problems, HIV, uh, to uh, provide health institutions, build houses, etc. So thanks to tourism, we've managed to protect uh, all these plants and insects and birds in the area. We also protect the beaches. Uh, ocean biology is a very important important discipline today. You can see that there's no plastic to be found there on the beach. There are wells, nature is beautiful. They were almost eradicated 100 years ago, but the population is growing to the tune of 7% today. At the same time, we wanted to involve the local population. You can't have a, a nature reserve today if you do not involve the local population. They should take part in this. We've got an unemployment in South Africa to the tune of 40 percent in our region. It's not that the people do not want to go to school. Very often they don't have the possibility because there are no means of transport. Very often they have to walk. So we started uh, with several schools where we provide training to the people. And then afterwards, they help us in uh, natural sciences. They work as guides. They show around the guests. They provide services. They show the guests what we do. And we also have our own vegetables that we grow. So everything that the customers need in the lodge, um, be it meat, vegetables, etc., we produce that ourselves. So uh, we created jobs uh, for uh, the local population. We set up a foundation in 2003, and this foundation works together with groups, and thus we've got the possibility and we call it progressive tourism. So we've got the possibility to hire people from this area that work in the foundation and Krupus as a company buys the products at market prices. This gives us the possibility to do these things. These are just some impressions. Well, this was just a, a brief outline of what we do. Thank you very much and over to you. Well, it's a five-star lodge combined with a private nature reserve, which is organized in an international association called Long Run. We heard about Four Seas. Plus, there is a foundation, which is part and parcel of the entire activity. Uh, you forgot to mention that sports is also important. I read that yesterday. So uh, this is important uh, for uh, young um, teenagers and for the poor population so as to help them. Thank you very much. OK, so the microphone is working. So first of all, good morning, and thank you very much indeed for the invitation. 
thank you very much to the invitation to a place I am not familiar with, not because I don't like uh, trade show pavilions. It's rather about contents. And this um, um, means that we can immediately talk about the issue, tourism and its uh, destructive effects. I'm a radical critic of growth and a critic of mobility. I would never dare to uh, simply say that tourism is bad or to uh, tell you that you shouldn't uh, go traveling or to think that there would be a democratic majority which um, tells politicians to limit tourism. Nonetheless, I believe that this is the most destructive activity when talking about tourism. And then I'm talking about a very specific tourism I'm referring to that is the one based on um, trips with aircraft or cruises, for instance. Let us think about it. Let us keep in mind that climate protection is not just a nice to have or just uh, some uh, add-on. I'm sorry, I still have a slight cold. No, but this is a question of survival, especially to uh, stick by the two degree climate objective. Now, we have to wonder why do we want not want to keep objective. What are the obstacles? We need to mention uh, mobility and funding as well. It is obvious that the operation or the functioning of a modern society has as a prerequisite mobility. And since e-mobility is not working, and since the German energie vendor also failed, it gets quite obvious that we need to have a certain uh, quantum of fossil mobility so as to purchase merchandise as goods, so as to maintain and the infrastructure of modern societies. However, tourism is luxury. A lack of tourism has never resulted in a person dying, uh, dying because of hunger or being persecuted or having other serious problems. But if we didn't have, have any uh, lorry transport in the city centers or uh, if we didn't have any transport to the hospitals for the hospital dispensaries, then it would be a problem. So mobili mobility is not mobility. And we've got aviation. Uh, it is breaking new records every single year. And this is the climate issue we need to tackle. You know. Um, I am really a harsh critic of uh, coal and lignite for generating electricity. I'm also against nuclear power. I'd still differentiate between the generation of electricity through coal, which very often is without alternative, because there's no hospital that you can run without electricity. And you do not have vending machines or petrol stations or building uh, or other means of infrastructure that you can run without electricity. This is just one uh, point. Whilst um, air transport uh, is something which we have um, made to become a mass goods within a few decades only. Most people uh, I talk to use planes just like they used to take uh, cabs. And I have to give you some figures. The regulative idea of sustainability uh, with regard to climate protection would mean that the two degree climate objective cannot be negotiated because this is the program of survival for for uh, mankind and human civilization. Let's suppose, uh, we, well, there's the CO2 equivalent quantity. If we uh, refer this to the 7.3 billion people around the world, if we um, open this equation, then every person in the world could use 2.5 tons of CO2 by 2050. And then we would have to completely recalculate the equation. And then uh, we would have to uh, reduce this to one ton per capita. One trip by aircraft to Sydney, Australia and back means between 12, 10 and 12 tons of CO2 to Beijing, approximately four tons, a trip to New York from here, Berlin, approximately between 3.2 and 4.2 tons. So one long haul trip completely destroys the entire potential of ecological consumption and utilization in regard to climate protection that one individual person can use if he or she wants to use, uh, wants to say, I'm not uh, someone polluting nature. and. Uh, Air, air transport is um, really a disaster. I don't want to say that we completely have to stop aircrafts from flying because I think modern civilization needs some planes, of course, because of the diplomatic reasons uh, for once, uh, because otherwise we would have an isolationist cultural model. We need uh, connections to the outside. We need intercultural competencies as well. But uh, the situation we're currently in is the following one. In Germany, for instance, in 2017, 
2019, there were 235 million air passengers. And I have to say it again, this is a disaster in ecological terms. It's uh, not necessary. It's pure luxury. And if we want to take climate protection and sustainable development seriously, we need to reduce where we've got the greatest potential of leverage, where um, generally speaking, it is possible to reduce this pollution where it means to uh, reduce our indulging in total luxury like in old uh, Roman times. We won't ask the audience who went on an air trip last time and who had a good conscience. This would be an interesting question to ask. Well, Mr. Pich uh, went here uh, on foot or on bicycle, but just in time, so it's uh, fair enough. Uh, but no kidding. The question is, uh, we have nature not only in Germany, but elsewhere as well. We want to make sure that the nature looks beautiful. Gorillas are beautiful animals, but it's also about questions of survival, uh, such as genetic pools in the rainforest, in the savanna. We are talking about uh, the dying of insects, for instance. Um, sometimes we have to fly uh, to other destinations. Maybe you've got a proposal. Well, this is quite presumptions. First of all, uh, the biggest destruction of nature that we have to prevent, this biggest destruction takes place in Germany. The new federal government decided to invest millions of euros so as to uh, build 1.5 million new flats. You know what that means for German nature? And on top of that, we've got the so-called uh, energy uh, transition, the energy vendor. What has taken place in the rural areas in the countryside? Uh, well, there are the many investments into the traffic uh, systems, the new um, industrial areas, and still the expansion of industrial agriculture, which has not been limited. And then you fly to South Africa to work there. But we need you here. Just behind Cologne, there is uh, an open pick mining which uh, has the same size of the Lake Constance. And we fly to Honolulu and try to save uh, insects there. Secondly, biodiversity is decreasing significantly, and this is the result of climate change. So first and foremost, we need to talk about climate protection and make sure that we protect biodiversity. This is not the only reason you're right. There are other um, uh, civilizations, um, engagements um, where nature is destroyed. I do not think that your project is bad. Please do not misunderstand me. Let me briefly answer to this. I've seen your presentation on YouTube the workshop of the future. And I simply have to say that uh, as far as a lot of things are concerned, I fully agree with you. This is a problem we are looking into. And if you board a plane today and you fly from Hamburg to Milan so as to simply go shopping, well, this is not acceptable. And if you have to eat exotic fruit in wintertime, this is not acceptable either. We should be more modest still for us, tourism, is important for international understanding as well. You can only enter into contact with a person and understand another human being if you're close to this person, if you can smell and feel this other person. So this is important in our tourism because customers come to us. They go to our foundation. The foundation gets approximately half a million euros a year. We've got more than 40 employees, and we try to protect nature, etc., etc. Where do we get the money from? No, it doesn't come from our South African colleagues. It comes from our visitors, uh, be it from America or from other countries of the world that come to visit. Now, these people may understand that question that you've just raised. They would say, if I'm ruining coal, Cologne, or I'm building things, let me help somewhere why I can in other places. In other words, um, you know, I wouldn't approach a university saying, please um, give me 5,000 euros to retrain unemployed people to become gardeners. No one would invest that money. We're talking about international understanding. At the moment, South Africa is facing an enormous drought. You may have realized that, right? There's no water in Cape Town, basically. I think uh, we have about 10 customers uh, telling me, Mr. Lutzaya, if I'm going back to Germany, I'm trying to contain myself with 100 liters of water per day. 
This is what we see here in South Africa. We can't take a, a, a hot tub, right? Because we only have uh, 50 liters of water. I'm not using the swimming pool. I wasn't aware of that, says the German colleague. But I'm doing to do that at home. I'm trying and doing that. Now, if people realize that you're destroying nature in one place, that hopefully it raises your awareness. Promise, maybe. Is that's the man But. What is important is that people need to understand each other. We are all one family of nations in a global world. Uh, we must do things better together. Together In Africa, we don't want to see a situation like we have in Cologne, and therefore we're learning from you and you're learning from us. And I think there's a lot of potential in that. OK, let me say that. International understanding, uh, the human civilization, everything that pacifies civilizations is a great thing, no doubt about it. But. Tourism is not just a uh, basis on which international understanding can flourish. This beautiful left-wing liberal multicultural ideology, meaning that um, air travel and digitization come together and then everybody will be cuddling up with one another and cooperate in peace, is just not right. It's tomfoolery because everything, if everything was related to one another and if tourism uh, fills all the different niches in the economy, everything will be competing. Tourism can be destructive cultures, can be destructive to international cultures. People who can afford to travel stand as a representative of a materialized culture, and they get in contact with people that are degraded by that contact, because all of a sudden they wake up and open their eyes saying, well, I could live like that as well. They're, dis they're beginning to doubt the validity of their own culture, because they feel that their life hitherto was insufficient. And this is not only a degradation of people or uh, defaming of other people's cultures and life that are certainly not contributing to prosperity and peace. This destruction of cultures has three upshots, has three upshots. People seem to overcome a culture that traditionally has always been stable for them. And like with a pry bar, they are now trying to uh, break up the prospering life of uh, a consumer society. That's what's happening in China and India, mind you. And unfortunately, it's also taking place now in uh, Africa, also in Latin America. Now, the second upshot is uh, people want to get out of their, old, of their own countries, migration. This is what happened in Africa. And the third version of that is a clash of cultures. People with their freedom of movement and their staging of material superiority uh, to contribute to that degrading nature of people leads to conjuring up new images of the enemy, like IS, like Boko Haram, what have you. They're not good at all. In other words, don't misunderstand me. There is international understanding. There's intercultural exchange, no doubt about it. But I'm critical about this type of growth. We must curtain or curtail uh, growth. In the 1970s, we were not shut up from the rest of the world. We were not uh, devoid of empathy. I have never been to Africa or Latin America or Asia in my life, never. But I feel a lot of empathy for those people. And still, what I can do here uh, should make a contribution towards uh, being more sustainable. I want to see a more equitable planet, a more ecological planet, and to work here in these countries in order to help people in other parts of the world, including Africa. But it doesn't mean I need to fly there all the time. Well, Mr. Lutzaya, let me ask you a question on a somewhat different level. Now, where? seem from the outside as the outsiders with our Eurocentric view of the world. We always seem to identify problems. We want to solve the problems that we see globally, uh, the do-gooders, right? And I mean, there are many good approaches that also you have. And those individual examples uh, are then used uh, as a showcase by industry in order to justify the bigger picture that normally works actually by other mechanisms. Now, what about your local tourism industry in South Africa? What about the large uh, tour operators, the large hotel chains? Uh, do you see any parallels there? Where would you compare your model uh, to, um, to the rest of the industry? Uh, or maybe are you just this one single uh, flagship project? Well, I hope it's not only a small flagship or a beacon of hope, uh, and I hope I can get people thinking. Also, at a panel discussion like this here today, 
I'd like to spread the word as well. You can do such 4C projects, if I, as I touched on. Maybe that's not quite right compared to other African countries, because we had apartheid in the country for 40 years. Not much was done for local African people in our country. Now, we live 100 miles away from Cape Town, just 160 kilometers down from Cape Town. You cannot travel to Cape Town with public transport. There is, in other words, no public transportation in the country from us to Cape Town. 50% of people in South Africa live what we call below the bread line. They cannot travel. They cannot physically be on the go for that reason. And therefore, we are not uh, sitting in our five-star lodge saying, uh, you know, we're self-contained. No. We want to reach out to the local community to bring people on board, to uh, bring children on board. What we are doing cannot be done without educating children, the future generation. They come to visit us uh, for day outings. They stay for the weekend. And we teach them uh, you know, the projects of the future. Now, I don't know if that answers your questions you had before. We are not a, a fly and drive um, um, object or property. We have people come to see us uh, to look at the problems, the local problems. They want to uh, feel the experience of being immersed in, a, in our culture. A modern travel industry, we believe, can work by returning something to the communities, by watching nature, by um, nurturing also that nature, and by uh, creating a great time for tourists. Of course, our tourists are always uh, faced with a dilemma, and I cannot answer you that question, but with the advance of technology, and I'm not a prophet, of course, maybe, though, in 15 years, we only have electric airplanes flying around the world. I could only hope for that. I never thought about smartphones to uh, be developed. I never thought that electric cars would be driving. Well, I ordered a Tesla two years ago. Now, I don't know whether we had to, uh, ever get that one, but uh, I hope it'll get that, go that way. And I, I'm, again, I'm not sure if that answers uh, your question. OK, let me put that in different words there for you. It's a very impressive example that you have shown to us about the sustainability of a travel project. But does that actually represent the bigger picture? Yeah, yeah, the bigger picture, absolutely, because all of South Africa is now trying to do that. If you go to the nature reserves, and over-tourism was one of the words there. Now, the Kruger National Park, as you know, is our largest national park. You all know that one. And they are trying to manage processes there as well. The local tourist play, pays five euros admission fee. And then when you guys are coming, you would have to pay 30 euros admissions fee. So the local people still get uh, uh, the access, are offered uh, subsidies, and we're talking about 20,000 square kilometers here, and they're limiting admission to 11,000 visitors per day. If you could do um, animal watching programs, now, because of the apartheid heritage, in, in inverted commas, and uh, not many visitors coming to the countries, we are now um, uh, repeating this boom phase of the 1970s and 80s, because it didn't happen at the time in South Africa. What a reticulation, not only us, but also the hotel. It's not only us that have these great systems. Uh, um, this is not massive tourism there tourism for the masses in South Africa. And again, as we've seen, uh, when you fly to South Africa, it costs you four, th four tons of CO2. Right, now, that's a question uh, for, for Mr. Pesh, and you can uh, uh, give uh, really very impressive uh, speeches, and I actually agree with many of the things you're saying, although I'm neutral, obviously, as a host here. But let me ask you this. We're talking about some experimental cases, best practice examples. Uh, if we're going to shut them off now, as you are saying, uh, and leave it all to the uh, hostile um, you know, players of the industry, like cruise industry or the sun and beach tourism, I don't even know where I'm going when I book a tour. Um, I don't know if my swimming pool is going to be uh, round or square, and I don't know how much food that is going to be. Now, would that be an argument uh, to say we are getting rid of even the best practice and the sustainable projects? Uh, but wouldn't you um, uh, agree there is international understanding? How radical are you in that? Are you rejecting just everything, all of tourism? Well, whether this example has something to do with international understanding, I don't get it. Sorry. Number two, 
It's quite a tall order, I think, or quite um, is presumptuous to say that we, the Eurocentrics, that have wrought so much havoc on the world, are now traveling to South Africa, trying to be the mentors of children and uh, like in a patrimonious way, showing people what needs to be done. No, we are the developing world. We uh, produce 12 tons of CO2. We are the ecological barbarians. And we are going to tell the non-barbarians how the world's going to take. It's like the, all the international students um, that uh, are attending my courses, also English class courses. Now, first of all, they need to learn how the Germans are living and they're then adopting that lifestyle. Uh, maybe they pick up some contents, uh, thematic contents in their lectures. But if uh, international understanding is uh, communicating vessels, that means uh, that uh, the standard of living goes up in one side and down on the other one, uh, leads to then that would lead to more ruinous practices. You should just instead give people a chance to develop their own lives, uh, decide their own fate without external intervention. But here's my proposal. If tourism was just about project like yours, and I know that you're very happy and you have your heart in it, uh, and I'm not uh, in apportioning any blame on you. But if, say, tourism was just doing what you are doing, the great things that you are doing, then imagine this. I talked about those 2.5 tons of uh, CO2. No, I didn't come up with that. All cl climate researchers will tell you. If you were to live to be 80 years, uh, which is the average life expectancy uh, or the lower end of it, uh, you actually wouldn't uh, do your calculations on a pocket calculator. It would mean that you have a total budget of 200 um, tons of CO2, 200 million tons of uh, CO2. Uh, you would be have to be you have to be a vegetarian living in, a, in an apartment smaller than 40 uh, square meters. You're not using a smartphone, but an old one. Uh, you're just using old uh, shabby clothes. And then imagine all the savings per per annum could be then accumulated, and then for the course of your life, uh, if you're very uh, sparing, you can do two, three, four air travels throughout your life, and then you go to your resort and not to the swimming pools. I would realize that, that this would make sense. But imagine, and let's look towards the future here. The adventure of travel could also be this. Let's slow down again. My colleague that I've never met because uh, I've never been there, she's from Boston, Juliet Sean. She wrote about uh, planitude. Uh, she talks about slow travel, saying people, in a situation where our consumer society is based on growth, and it's probably going to collapse anytime soon, you have less money, but you have more time. Imagine we have sailboats again. Sailing would be a great adventure, say two or three times a year. No more than that, because it costs you too much time. Two or three times a year, I'm going to encounter a new continent, a different continent, in a sailboat. This adventure is much more uh, impressive. Tourism is a, uh, is a machine. It's an inflationary machine. Experience and consumption can only create a stimulus that leads to a higher quality of life if this activity doesn't happen too often. So I think your project should be upgraded from the point of views of uh, those who visit you, saying do it two, do it three, do it four times in your lifetime, and then you can look at a project like that. Because the overall balance sheet, if you will, your CO2 footprint ecologically uh, has to be equitable. Isn't, th isn't that a proposal? Well, I'm surprised. Thank you very much. I don't know what to say even. But, but if I may, let me echo something you just said. Uh, people who travel to Africa and to South Africa, I don't think they come see us to um, you know, provide uplifting inspiration for other people. We have uh, a quince tree, and our tourists are saying, look, I started buying uh, you know, stuff locally produced, uh, produce uh, from Hamburg or from the Elbe Valley. People are going local now in Germany as well. Community gardens is also what your uh, report says. We are planting them, trying to repair things. So what I was saying earlier was that uh, the mistakes people are making today that you're trying to revert are now being transferred to another uh, arena. And this is also why people support us. Maybe because they have a bad conscience, 
Maybe they made it wrong in the past, and they want to make, make up for it. Can we start that with uh, domestic travel, domestic tourism, or do you always need incoming travel from abroad? So what about South African travel travelers from your region? Well, South Africa tourism does that. There's a campaign. But I told you before, we have no transportation in the area. People are very poor. There's many different options that we're now trying to develop uh, domestic uh, internal tourism. Now, here's an example. 4% of tax revenue in uh, South Africa comes from the workforce, just 4%. All of the tax revenues, only 4%. We're talking about 15 million people that get uh, subsidies, state subsidies on their wages. Uh, I don't think I'm allowed to say that if there are South Africans in the room. I mean, there would be major un unrest uh, unless 15 million people every month uh, get about 100 euros from the government, 1,500 rand, in order to keep them alive. That's state subsidies. Out of many reasons, uh, corruption, we have a new president. Uh, things are really going to move forward. We really like to spur internal tourism, especially in the low seasons. Okay, let's, let's involve the audience here. Which of you can imagine to, uh, to travel long distance uh, to, a to a destination if you think um, it's uh, going to be sustainable. Now, which of you would be ready to uh, travel a day rather than one hour if the destination is sustainable? Well, okay. Okay, that's interesting. We need to do some more work on that. That's a good start there. Okay. I uh, don't want to switch around between German and English because our interpreters are having a hard time here. But what would that mean? What would that mean uh, if uh, there are no tourism, no tourists anymore in this world? And uh, by the way, uh, uh, Michael is from South Africa. He shouldn't work in the Ruhr Valley. He's working in South Africa. He has a South African passport after all. But imagine if no one were coming to, no one was coming to your countries. What about the what about the whales, whale watching? What about nature? If you have no incoming tourism from abroad anymore, what about your local travelers? Uh, maybe um, you patch up just a few fewer fewer stars, not five, but less than that stars on your lodge, and then make it affordable to your local travelers? Well, of course, there's always solutions out there. We're incredibly expensive. That is true. 800 euros per room is what we charge to a room per what? Per night. 800 euros per night. OK, just to know what we're talking about here, right? Well, it includes many things, lunch, breakfast, everything. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, travel tours, etc. But what I'm, what I'm saying is this. Our travelers. We could never you know, put up posters, say, come uh, look at the social uh, way of life in South Africa and the botanical wonders of the world. No, we can't do that. But once people have arrived, they embark on a journey that was unprecedented. We take them on a botanical tour. And especially with gentlemen, if we tell people, let's do a flower safari, well, the only reason why, they, why, why men are joining is because their wives are doing or are suggesting a wine safari. But if they understand how it all links together, the flowers and the pollinators, and what they can do in order to preserve that, this will change people's lives. This is what we do. We change people's lives. To do tourism. We are hoping, we hope, that so can light together. We're hoping that people, just as you are saying, uh, coming to a hotel and say, look, why aren't you doing the same than your colleagues in South Africa? Why are you uh, putting your corporate uh, money in American uh, shares? We're going to boycott your hotel unless you're investing in the future. Carbon footprint, recycling of water, etc. Otherwise, we don't care. So if you do that, I'm not going to be your hotel guest anymore. This is positive pressure that people apply, and this is actually why we call it progressive tourism. This is what we're working on, and uh, this is our passion, but not only for, for Grotbus, but uh, many other uh, properties in South Africa. That's all I can say about it. I think, yes, we are a pioneer. 
we are setting the tone as well as a role model, and that is hard to do. Um, you know, you know, half of the people of the audience will leave this room today saying these are nuts. Um, but we're just starting this movement. This is what it is about. Now, isn't that just uh, nature conservation for the rich? Uh, and I'm really uh, going to battle here for Mr. Pesh. This is what he's saying. You're all so, so nice and do-gooders, um, but if you're flying to South Africa and spending 800 uh, euros a day, is that the only way to do it? Well, 30% of what our travelers pay goes back to our communities, 30%. 30% of the money stays in the communities, and our guests know that. Uh, you can have a look at our balance sheets. So everything is transparent. We work according to this principle. Now, I don't know if that, I don't know if that answers your question, but in order to do nature conservation, the South African government has no money for education, no money for nature conservation, uh, for marine life either. The only way to get it is, uh, you, you know, you get a good feeling while you're here, dear guest. Uh, you can uh, be on board. You can be a friend of Grootbos. You can send your children to come join us. Ninety European children uh, um, have just graduated from grammar school, uh, have come to our uh, lodges already, and um, uh, they have also uh, studied tourism. And I'm telling them also, people that I meet here, you know, here's my business card. Come, come see me. Come uh, join us in South Africa, like so many other people have already done, because this is how you see what tourism ta uh, looks like in other parts of the world. No, well, we cannot. We cannot make young people freaking travelers, put them on planes and fly them around the world. That would be the end of the story. We are, uh, you know, living beyond of what uh, this uh, planet can cope with. Nature conservation is absolutely right, of course, and the experience uh, and the enjoyment of nature uh, and the emotional link with nature obviously is a very good thing, and we can only reinforce how important that is. But let me say this also. If uh, I live kerosene-free in uh, Europe, mind you, and if you want to see the uh, genuine nature reserves, as it were, in Europe, you know, by going there by a bus, public bus, or public transport, or by hiking, or uh, by a bicycle, I would take, uh, you know, uh, f five lives in order to get it done. No. Um, let's start with your good things in front of your doorsteps. If the Europeans are dealing with African nature, it's not related to our own habitats anymore. German nature is not pure anymore. Why? It's the result of cultivation processes. We have well-cultivated landscapes in this country, in this continent, uh, that have a natural value, an aesthetic value, an ecological value. We need more nature here. But what that means is that we clean up our act in this country and not elsewhere, the other part of the world. Now, I'm uh, not only a sustainability researcher, I'm an activist as well, if you will. I'm an activist of the nature conservation movement. And it's really strange when you go to northern Germany um, and you're trying, like at the North uh, Sea coast, uh, to prevent uh, people to build uh, a chicken farm. You know, there are 30,000 chicken there. I'm trying to avoid such a development project there. So anyway, it's just very strange. In the summer, I don't find people that support me in this endeavor. They're always traveling. Obviously, they're against a big chicken farm, but they're not. They're not ready to sign the sheet. Not ready to, to sign the sheets for me. Now, imagine the, um, the Africans have the same money that we have to uh, work here for nature conservation in Germany. That's nonsense. Unless you work in front of your own doorsteps, you cannot work elsewhere. Unless you do just artifacts work, if you if it were. And this takes me to our last two questions that we can still take. Mr. Lutzer, the long run. What is that organization, the long run? OK, let me say it in a nutshell. Long run was created by Mr. Zaitz, uh, who was the CEO of Puma. And uh, uh, they have a lot of manufacturing going on uh, in the Middle East and Asia. And then he says, no, it doesn't work anymore. Let's bring that competence uh, to other parts of the world. Now, for us, he said, they need a piece of land that you need to preserve, so the conservation aspect, if you will. You need to take care of your local community around your property. That's a very important factor, mind you. You need to take care of the culture of people. 
In other words, that we are not changing the culture of the indigenous people. Quite on the contrary, we have to absorb their culture and to emulate it, if you will, and to help them preserve their culture um, in, in, in lines with what people have done 100 years ago. And the fourth one is commerce. These are the four C's in our DNA. So we're not taking any decisions um, at Grid Boss unless all four C's are being uh, reflected um, adequately. We are approaching the four C's. Uh, so this is a yardstick of all, of all our work. Now, this organization now um, is spreading very dynamically across the world. I think we have someone in the room here today. Now, I don't know how many long-run members we have in the room. Uh, um, I think there are a total of 15 globally uh, accredited ones. This is an association of private nature conservation areas. Maybe we should mention that as well. Yeah, and long run tries to work with uh, local communities. Now, this is very important. It's not only nature conservation. It's working with people in order to not have things happen that happen in other parts of the world. We need to educate children, in other words. Uh, on, um, Obviously, uh, I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally uh, with you um, in some areas, and I'm obviously also a great proponent of uh, uh, soil separation of waste. But where are we going from here? What are we going to do? Are we going to put up a new wall around Germany that people don't fly or leave the country anymore? Let's take the Chinese. They're developing travel and tourism. They're traveling very much also to other parts of the world. Where do you think we go from here? What is the first step in order to alleviate that situation? That's a million euro question, or let me call it a hundred euro question, and it's uh, too little time now to answer that. Uh, and I'm happy to give presentation and speeches on a transformative effect of a society in a post-growth economy. That's a rather radical version of uh, what was called sustainable development in the past. But here's the point. We don't have political powers that implement sustainability. And I think we all agree here. Unless you have personal commitment unless you have your under the understanding that an enlightened person has responsibility, personal responsibility, without that understanding, we're not going to change things. Your local carbon, local or oh, personal carbon footprint is, the f is priority number one. Uh, the average in Germany is 12, and this is because not everyone's uh, flying long distance. Uh, so uh, um, it in also includes um, uh, babies, um, elderly people, and uh, detainees that I don't travel at all. So we're talking about the average here. The uh, carbon footprint uh, is very important. This is where it starts. And soil separation of waste, solar power, uh, Tesla cars can't even possibly um, uh, turn the wheel around. So, yes, you need three and a half minutes only if you look at the Federal Environmental Agency's website to calculate your own online carbon footprint. Well, do it. And then you realize how you can change your life and to jettison stuff you don't need. Jettisoning stuff you don't need doesn't mean doing without uh, uh, consumption. And I don't have the time to talk about consumption patterns in this society. This is not about parsimony. It's not about ect ecological dictatorship. No. It's about awareness raising. You know, start you know with your own act. And often in the large cities, there are many good projects around there. There's many like-minded people, not only urban gardening, as you've said, that you can do, but also post-fossil mobility, take uh, cargo bikes in Berlin or Oldenburg, where I live, uh, use uh, repair cafes, transition towns, local currencies, uh, community-supported agriculture, solidarity-based agriculture, no packaging in supermarkets, also in Berlin, of course. In other words, there's millions of different interesting projects that are incremental steps that will be an option to reduce your carbon footprint that is equitable and just, uh, that is possible to be multiplied by 7.3 billion people without needing more than one planet for everyone to live on. Well, thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. I think there was a great closing remark. There's not much that I can say. Uh, the tone of the debate was really good. The hot seat uh, last year, we had uh, the cruise ship industry, and there was um, uh, too much uh, understanding and uh, things uh, going easy, overly easy, I should say. Now, I hope.